you. Thank you very much, Maria, for that lovely introduction. I want to introduce my colleague, and my co-worker today, Rosalia Vargas. And uh, Rosalia is a caterer here in San Antonio and also a cook, a very experienced chef and an expert and a connoisseur of this type of, of cuisine with lots of experience. So welcome to you, too. I um, was born in San Antonio and uh, for 23 years have been away. I returned about six years ago. I was living in Amsterdam and traveling the world as a, as a grant maker. I went to uh, Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and I returned here and having experienced all the cultures and the food that was so important in my work, I, uh, I wanted to embellish the narrative and understanding of our food, which has been oftentimes misunderstood. So th what I'm going to do today is really present that I'm cooking today in my ancestral land. And uh, the food that we're going to eat is known as Texas Mexican food. Uh, some people uh, confuse it with Tex-Mex, which is a restaurant food that started in the 70s. I'm not going to cook nor talk about that. What I'm going to do is uh, talk about the food that I cook, that my family cooked, that has roots here for 12,000 years, and how his, it has impacted who I am as a person, my identity as a Chicano, and how it has helped my family stay together, how it has helped our memory of who we are stay together, and how when I travel other to other communities, by having and sharing the same food, we bond. There's a cohesiveness, there's a, there's a natural memory. And how, uh, how food has shown to be an effective strategy for community and how we have done that. The, uh, the ideas that I present are about cooking as an art practice. It is an artistic practice that connects us. I always like to say, you know, we eat to, to, to survive, but it's not, it's not that we survive, it's how we survive, how we choose to survive. And so it becomes an art form. It's an art form that connects us to each other, and therefore it's a relational art form. I, all art really uh, ends up being that. And then it's also connecting us to the land, which involves uh, issues of ethics and sustainability. And, but food, by actually cooking and sourcing it, uh, calls forth these, these ideas. And we'll be talking about that. As I cook and as I talk about the food, uh, you may be making these connections. And if you do and you want to share, uh, go ahead and do so. I met some of you last night, so I know that you're very experienced in the relational part of art and how powerful it is. I know that you have ideas about this, so and certainly about food. So uh, when you want to share that, and because you're making connections, please do so, it'll, it'll help all of us. Uh, the book that I wrote uh, is a peer-reviewed book. It's published by Texas Tech University Press. I wanted it to be published by a university because a popular book would be good, but I, make, uh, I tell the story of the under-told Mexican-American women, Mexican-American families, and our roots on this land. Uh, and I wanted it to be peer-reviewed because we talk about Native American history, food anthropology, and archaeology. And uh, I'm very happy that I think they did a, a very nice job. It's been on the Amazon bestseller list, Southwest Cooking, for three years now. Uh, <laughs> I finished a manuscript for a second one. Uh, this will be out in July. It's called... Uh, the Art of Texas Mexican Cooking. Don't count the tortillas. And it, it sort of pushes us forward. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the second book here, more about the relational part of it and how we've grown into the modern way of cooking this food. I uh, am going to uh, cook gorditas, which you see there, and I'm going to cook cactus, which is up here. If you all wanna come up here and touch it, I, I dare you because it's full of spines, so don't. We're gonna talk about the history the geography of this flavor profile, and the, I mean, the ge geography of this food, and the flavor profile. I, um, I'm going to talk also about the oral history that I have with my family, uh, my memory. So it, this is a very personal book. To publish it, I, I did a lot of uh, visiting with all of my brothers and sisters to recall how my mom cooked the food. So it is very much uh, a, not just a symbol, but a product of my family's uh, thinking and history and sharing. I first coined the term Texas Mexican food because it was uh, Tex-Mex uh, that was taking over. The dominant narrative is Tex-Mex and uh, 
it's Anglo and Mexican, and that's not what we're talking about. What I'm going to talk about is the region of Texas Mexican food. I'm going to do a little bit of introduction to the history, and then we're going to start cooking. And then after we cook, uh, which Rosalia will be helping me, then uh, Rosalia is going to finish the gorditas, and we're going to have cactus and shrimp gorditas with a chile rojo um, sauce. So we'll have that for the tasting. This is a map, map of the Republic of Mexico as Mexico uh, had it in 1824. And we take a closer look, you see, how does this work? This is San Antonio, we're right here. This used to be a river, now it's a border, of course. And we take a closer look, this is the region of the food we're talking about. It's a cohesive region. I used to go in a pickup truck here, we would travel down here to, to Nava, Coahuila. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, before, eight, before 1848, when the U.S.-Mexican War was ended and uh, the U.S. ended up with all of this territory, which used to be Mexico, this region was and continues to be a cohesive region. We have similar geography, similar cooking techniques. My uh, relatives live here in San Antonio, but they also live here. Even though we had a border, our, my family is still extended on both sides of the river. And birds here don't care about crossing the border. They're going to take the seeds over here. So it is one cohesive region. If you travel this region, it will be very, very similar in food. There is a, there is a uh, stereotype that there is Mexican food and there is San Antonio food. And that's not entirely right. There is not one Mexican food cuisine. There are several Mexican cuisines. You would think of, for example, Italian. You have Lawrence, you have Tuscany, you have Bolognese. And in Mexico, likewise, you have different cuisines. So here we have, if you can see that, see that's Oaxaca. That's Oaxaca Mexican cuisine, which is known for moles. And there's also Jalisco Mexican cuisine, which is known for uh, birria, pozole, and uh, Sinaloa as well, uh, another type of chile. And we have Texas Mexican cuisine. So it's Oaxaca Mexican, Puebla Mexican, other Mexican, and Texas Mexican. It's one part, it's one type of regional cuisine of the, of the larger picture, which is the Mexican cuisine. And we share similarities. We use chiles, we use chocolate, we have uh, techniques that do not fry, we just uh, roast and so forth. And uh, many people, when I cater, say, but this is Mexican food. Well, yes, because it's Texas Mexican, but it resembles Mexico, therefore it had to come across the border like, like all of the Mexican Americans came from across the border. My answer to that is, we didn't come from anywhere. Our food was here 10,000 years ago, long before the river was a border. And so I show this map, which is a reconstruction of the, uh, of the trip that Cabeza de Vaca took when he was uh, in uh, Texas. Cabeza de Vaca was the first European to set foot in Texas. It was in 1528. He arrived, he was shipwrecked. And he was shipwrecked here near Galveston Island. The Native Americans found them. They were starving, they were dying, they nursed them back. He stayed about seven years. Uh, he complained that he was kept like a slave, but he was just like everybody else. If you're gonna live here and you're gonna eat, you're gonna work like everybody else does. When he returned to the head of the, Mexico, of the Spanish Empire, which was here, he took this route. And he knew how to return by this route because the Native Americans told him how to get back. There's also another route that goes from San Antonio here. There's many Native American routes that, that uh, were used for commerce. They were used for communication. And that's why you have exchange of recipes, exchange of cooking, cooking techniques. That's why Texas Mexican food resembles somewhat Oaxaca Mexican food, Puebla Mexican food, because this entire region Mesoamerica and this area were in communication for hundreds of years before the arrival of the Spaniards. Therefore, our food has a similar characteristic, but if you go through the region, each one will be different. You'll taste it today. I'm going to go quickly to this. I'm just gonna show this slide because this is how old archeology span tells us. In Midland, Texas, a, 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 an actual uh, lady was found and she's dated 20,000 to 37,000, 10,000 to 12,000, because carbon dating can be debatable. I like to show this because if you move forward, that's Texas within the larger region. So you can look at Texas and see it as a geopolitical distinct 
region, but you also can look at it from the culinary perspective, and that is that weather, birds, animals, they just cross the border. And you, by looking at the larger region, you can understand the food a little bit better, and the people. In Texas, in 1500, there were 50,000 people. Some say as much as a million, 300,000. It's difficult because, you know, at the time there were no census. And as soon as the Spaniards arrived, the, the violence of the diseases were so strong, some of us died within three, four, five days. So it's very difficult to, to look back and, and see, but these are some ranges. And uh, we're going to be talking, I have three regions in the book. I call this the Central Texas Mexican region. And this is where San Antonio is. These are some of the names that the Spaniards gave to the local people. Now, they wrote them as best they could. They heard them and then they wrote them this way. So they may not all be right. These are just some of the people who lived there. And this is the, the, the coast. And you've got all of these people, Mariami, Tarancawa, the tribes and peoples who spoke distinct languages, had different cultural traits, dressed differently. And then you have the southern, which extends into Monterrey. And these are some of the, some of the people who are there. I think that every time that I cook, which is what I'm going to do now, I have identity uh, practice. And that is, is it the identity of US, is it the identity here? When I cook potatoes, they're from Peru. When I cook what we had last night, yuca, it's from Brazil. So in a sense, we are when we're tied to the land, we're also tied to the continent. So it's identity and community within the larger. There are many Latinidades, not just us. Not only that, but here is the black Atlantic. So we, for centuries, have a distinct African experience of the, Latino, of the Latino identity. So that's part of our food as well. So identity and community has to be explored and uh, it's in the Americas because that's where the land is that we're using as a source of food. And here we are, where are we? Uh, okay, we're over here, let's go back. I just wanna point out, we're a little tiny here. Here's where we are, right here. But we belong to a larger sense of the Latinidades. And here, I want to share, when I, uh, when I use a molcajete, this is volcanic rock from Mexico. This is the metaphor for the Mexican American community, the Texas Mexican community, because we cook by melding the various ingredients that make in harmony and beauty from very distinct things. This is how our culture was when the Spaniards arrived. So I'll talk more about this, but in our region, we use granite in the early days. This is Enchanted Rock, Texas. And here is a tip of a granite boulder that's about a mile long. It's huge, it's called Enchanted Rock. And if you get closer, you see little indentations. Maybe there, there, there. These are actually mortars. The ladies would sit around the bench and, and make paste, make puree, make uh, powders, make the way I do. They, you know, pounding, grinding. All of these are techniques that were invented years and millennia ago. So when I cook today, when I cook in my kitchen, I'm conscious that I'm not inventing these things. Culinary artists went before. And uh, stone cooking, where you have a hole in the ground, hello Hawaiians, <laughs> and, and you cook. And this, is a, this is a very specialized technique. You have to know how long the heat will be retained by the stones and, and so forth. This is in San Antonio, if you get a chance to go near almost Dam. This is dated at 4,500 4, years ago. When you go to the American Indians in Texas, they will tell you how the first uh, living human beings who had a culture here, uh, they, were, they arrived 13,000 years ago. So this is one of their ovens, and it's, they used it for baking, roasting, and it's not nilly-willy, it's all very controlled heat. <coughs> Stone boiling, you take bark or, 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 or hide, you make a bowl, and then you put rocks in it, and you boil, make a lovely soup or stew or guisado. And the Salt Lake in Raymondville, Texas, was used for, and it's still, I was just there, and within three days, if you empty the bottom of the lake, within three days, you get more salt. And it's been for hundreds and hundreds of years. When the Spaniards arrived, they of course realized how important it was, so they took it. So this day, to this day, it's called La Sal del Rey, which means the salt of the king. They simply took it, and so it was no longer the property of the Native Americans. 
who lived here. Right now, thankfully, it's a historic uh, district that it was just declared a few years ago. So we're very happy about that. The salt of the king. And now I think I'd like to cook something. Yes, I'm going to cook something. So we start with, and we start, what time are we ending? <laughs> we started at 1125. Okay. 1225. Will you pass these around? Start there and then over there. And then I want you to feel these cheese. Feel the chiles. Uh, I'm going to make a red chile colorado. This is a chile guajillo, and this is a chile ancho. We cook with chiles not for heat. Uh, we like heat, but you have to control the heat depending on the flavor. So when uh, you get uh, Red Hot Texan Chile and it's, uh, it's, it's number three, th it's a misnomer. I, I, tell, I teach uh, some classes at the Culinary Institute of America and I tell the, the, the young to be chefs, when you have a restaurant and you get a vendor who starts telling you, this is Schofield heat number five, this is number three, get rid of them, fire him. You do not buy chiles for the heat. You buy chiles for the flavor, for the texture, and for the color. And you have a variety of chiles. Each will have a different taste. That's what we're going to be selecting today to make the sauce that you're going to have. So the way that we cook with chiles, these are dried chiles. And uh, I, you deceive them by making a slit all along the side, which I will do now. And you have to do with this with each of the chiles. And after you do this, uh, after you do that, then, then you empty, you empty, you take the, the seed off, which has a lot of seeds, and you empty all the seeds out. And you take this membrane and you take it off. This is where the capsaicin resides. You don't want the heat. Take out the heat. This is capsaicin. You might wear rubber gloves because if you touch your eye, it will be it will be terrible. So this is, you see all this, take it all out. We don't want that. So then you're left with this, with this, this, we're left with this, and then you have to rehydrate it. So what I did is, um, I'll, we'll do the same thing with this, so that's fine. You rehydrate it, I, I took the chiles and I had them sit in water overnight, which is a nice way to do it they become rehydrated. If you don't have time, boil them, bring the water up to the boil and let them sit for 20 minutes. And then you put them in a blender, take out the spoon so that you don't have any difficulty. <laughs> they look like this once they've been rehydrated. Oh, by the way, I wanted to tell you, this one, if you felt it, this is, is, is used for the color. This is a bright, bright red color. So this adds color, very little taste. This one, the chile ancho, adds an earthiness, very sort of grounded uh, taste that you, you'll see. So this is what it looks like uh, rehydrated. This is the chile ancho. You put all of these in there. There's three or three. And look at how the, the red of the guajillo, see how red it is? You're adding color. You're adding color. So it's all up. It's all, uh, a uh, way that an experienced cook will know how to use these ingredients. That'll take care of it. Sorry to turn my back. Then we put the, the spices. The spices are, yeah. uh, uh, cumin, a little bit of salt, and garlic. And the garlic, here's the way I do it. I was going to already have it peeled, but I thought I'd tell you how I do it. Whack! Okay, cut the thing, and then you peel it. They throw it in. That has a, that's growing. It's growing a little baby. And then, uh, and then we just add a little bit of water so that the, um, the chile can blend properly. I use about a cup, maybe half a cup. There. Let's see if that's enough. And uh, and you let it you let it go. This is a 
This is a professional commercial Vitamix. I let it go for two minutes, maybe three minutes, and it gives you a very velvety. You don't want any granules. If you're if your home blender, oh, how many are cooks? Okay, I want you to do this at home. I mean, you will never make a sauce, the French sauces with, with butter and oil and powder. You will not have a sauce in France that you can have with this, with no oil, no butter. It's just so smooth. But, um, uh, les dices si, si sale, si sale muchos granos, que le haces? If you have granules, take a strainer, a very fine mesh sieve, and, and strain it. That's what we did. We cooked uh, at a show for uh, the Travel Channel, and, and, and Rosalia was doing it on actual metate, one of these. So it was, uh, they didn't give us enough time to do it, so she had to put it to a strainer. And so do that. You don't want any granules. The mouthfeel has to be velvety. Okay. Now, if you do it now, uh, the most restaurants will just serve this, you know, and they go. It goes into the product. We don't want the aceite de ninja sauce. We don't want that. We have to fry the chili. What happens with this is that the flavors are green. So you're you're going to get you're going to get uh, greenness. It's going to be a little bit bitter. It's going to be sour. You need to cook it so that the flavors all come together. And, you, and the, the color will also deepen. So I'm going to do that now. You add a little bit of oil. I never use lard, I use vegetable oil. Lard is a product of colonization. Uh, the Spanish brought in the pigs and they brought in the frying techniques. Um, we never did that. And I, along with a lot of Mexican chefs, are going back to vegetable oil. Uh, we don't use oil in tamales or any of that. And, uh, when the pigs first arrived, they didn't, the, the locals didn't like them. The, in my next book, I tell the story about the king in Michoacan. When they brought him the pigs, the Spanish did, six pigs, he says, ¿Qué? Estos señores nos, nos están trayendo ratas. <laughs> he said, these, these guys are bringing us giant rats. So he had them all slaughtered. He thought they were ugly and that they were bringing him bad luck. He was right about the second. Okay, so you have it, it, it splatters when it's hot. So you have to be careful. I sometimes, maybe I'll, maybe I'll use this. I sometimes use this to cover it. If it starts to, uh, to splatter, we'll put this on it. You have to let that, when, when it becomes cooked, then I will, let you, uh, I will let you actually taste it. I'm not taste it, actually see it. Because if you taste it, it'll be too hot. I want to uh, I want to uh, read a little bit from the book before I go into the into the cactus, because as I said, I always feel like since it's a personal story and it comes from my brothers and sisters, I really would like to give you a taste of the book. So this is a, this is a passage from the book, uh, Cuisine as a Strategy for Community, which is, and uh, it reads how food played a role, a key role in our ongoing identity is a fascinating part of our history. Having lost our land and language, along with economic and political standing, we continue to adapt, stepping into a new time and inventing strategies that would prove effective in the continuation and celebration of a people. Between 1492 and 1900, 90% of the native peoples of Texas died. The indigenous peoples who remained in Texas married with other tribes, with European settlers, and with Mexicans coming up from southern Mexico. They sometimes lived in Catholic missions and eventually came to be known as the Mexican people of Texas. It was a process of continuous change and adaptation. Food was the cultural activity that held us together. Cooking nurtured our remembering, and through it, we invented new identities rooted in that remembering. Preparing food was a day-by-day -day regeneration. And we continue doing this today. This is the food that my mother cooked and it keeps me, it keeps me grounded and it keeps me asking questions about is the sourcing of this food sustainable? Are the people in restaurants who cook
pay decent wages. They're all community people questions that this food, because we used to have the salt, we no longer own the salt. We used to have all of these things which, which, no longer, which we no longer have, but we are continuing to cook because we're blending things together. This molcajete was given to me by my mother, and once you have a molcajete in your family, you never get rid of it. When I pass away, one of my nieces and nephews will have this molcajete. And this molcajete is the great, great, great grandmother of this. <laughs> Thinking of our roots. We pass on to the, to the uh, nopalitos. I have a question. Yes. Excellent question, thank you. Uh, my mother would use it for coloring masa, for flavoring. She would have pour, poured the water in there. Uh, I don't because the sourcing of the chiles, I can't figure out. I don't, I don't know exactly who it comes from. Therefore, I don't know the level of pesticides. I don't know how it's been stored. So that's why I don't use it. But I would like to use it. If I grew my own and dried my own, I would use it. It's better. This is how you cook a cat. I mean, uh, uh, scrape a cactus. You take, some chefs do it, tú, tú lo haces con, con, yeah. Rosalia does it, does it with a knife. You just go to one of the little eyelets and you cut it off, see? And you do the next one, that's the next one. I use a, uh, I use a potato peeler. So you take, you, the way you do the potato peeler, you go and you work the edges first. I'm gonna touch it with my fingers. Many chefs do it. Wash your hands. You, see, you do all the edges, all around it. And then, and then you do the little eye, eyelids. You could do the same thing with the knife, just do the edges. So that is how you do it. We won't go through the entire process of cleaning those chiles. You get the idea. What we're going to do is go and uh, actually cook them. Le ponemos esta ya y aquella. Sí. I'm going to, and uh, here is how you do the, the cactus. Most people say, I don't like cactus. Um, it tastes gooey, and the taste is too acidic. And um, I don't think that's true. I think it's how you cook it. Now, if you want to cook this from my recipe book, and you can't find this, and you go out and you buy canned cactus, or cactus in a jar, you are going to culinary hell, for sure. <laughs> you don't do that. That's that's why it tastes bad. You, they, have, they have to be fresh, they have to be supple, and, and when you cook them for 17 minutes, me das unas cosas. When you cook them for 17 minutes, the little uh, viscosity, it, it, it goes away. So I'm going to put a little bit of veg vegetable oil, you put the, the cactus, and then we'll, we'll let it, uh, ah, that's just about right. <laughs> always, always be confident. <laughs> okay, now that's how you do, yes? Yes, yes. It's Opuntus, uh, uh, I forget that, yes. It's the, yeah. Yeah, it's prickly pear. And it sometimes, it gets a little, the little pink tunas. Yes, very good. Uh, this one is very good. You notice how it's green, it's supple. If it starts getting wrinkled and it's dry, then uh, don't buy it. Uh, so I would say no brown spots, no wrinkled, and it should be green. If, if it starts getting ashy, then, then don't buy it. There are some ladies in Houston who will clean them for you. Uh, but be careful if they've been cleaned and sold us in, in a package. Uh, I'm not saying you're gonna go to Culinary Hill directly, but but they put sulfites and, and be careful. It, you don't want chemicals in this. I know you're afraid of that place. Okay. Now we make the masa. Before I make the masa, let me give you a little bit more uh, history of, of how. See. Is this ready? Let me see the, the bottom of it. Yeah, yes, I'm going to. Okay, que se cuesta más. Quiero que se parta. I want, 
Is this on? Is this on? Okay, so get, getting back to the various regions, I want to go very, very quickly through the three regions that make up Texas Mexican cuisine. So you get an idea of the variety and how close to nature our food is and how it is that we continue to cook, striving for that even though we have corporate control of food, we have uh, vertical integration of grocery stores also controlling the source and so forth. I believe in gardens, I believe in community gardens and uh, if you come to Houston and see my garden you can see herbs and other. This is the central area, this is the Guadalupe River where we have catfish, you have carp, all of these were part of our diet. I'm going to go here so that you can... Deer, of course. All of these are indigenous foods that for hundreds of years we've been eating. Uh, in the river you have mussels, uh, freshwater mussels, and, and of course uh, uh, snails. Uh, we don't have this anymore because it, the rivers are so polluted you don't want to eat the mussels. And of course we did eat snails. And uh, the area here is uh, Sotol. This is what a sotol looks like, and it's a, a, a great source of vitamins and carbohydrates. What you do with a sotol is you, uh, pardon me, we've lost a slide. Okay. I think that one of the, one of the questions for artists from different cultures is, as we look at these, this land and the variety of foods, how is it that given so many cultures, we can have a cuisine, we can begin to cook in ways that are true to us and also true to the larger community. That is a question. I don't think there are easy answers for that, but I think it's a very important question uh, to be knowledgeable to. I think food should be intellectually delicious as well as being palatably delicious. So that's just a question that will remain, and I think, I think the artistic community will bring answers to that more so than nutritionists or scientists because it is a practice. It is a practice that you do and how you do it really impacts who the community is and how the community will become. This is ready, almost ready. Let me go to the, to the Gulf Coast. These are the names of the people whom we saw early, earlier. And uh, look at that beautiful. We do conch, we cook with conch, of course. Lovely red fish, snapper, and uh, uh, we do eat the oysters and mussels from the coast and the ducks, oh my goodness, and duck fat was also used. Uh, we, we also ate the fish eggs, so caviar is not new to us. And then we go down south, and down south you've got the Rio Grande Valley, and this is also a picture of the fish. Fish is a big, big part of our diet, although you wouldn't know if you went to a Tex-Mex restaurant and looked at the menu. But that's a restaurant food, which we like. I mean, it's very, many people love it, and it's used as celebration food, so that's fine, but uh, that's not our food. Look at that lovely turtle. This is agarita to make pies. Turkey is native to Mexico and to Texas. And of course, the delectable rattlesnake. Yum, yum, yum. Canapes, and uh, then you have eggs. And, uh, Based on that, I'm going to go over to the masa. But first, this is red. Ah, si. Está en chile cocido. Let me show you how the chile should be. If you're gonna cook it at home and you're a cook, I want to show you this. The chile should make a huella. What's huella in English? Huella. A uh, track. A track. So, you see? It needs to it needs to do that. See? It needs to do that. When it, when it, when it does that, then you, you know, then you're ready. Okay? It's a way. It separates. So you know that it's cooked enough, the flavors have developed, and the texture. Can you see that? Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. So that's the cooking technique. In Texas Mexican food, we develop flavor through technique as much as through ingredients. And then we put this in. First, I'm going to add a little bit of water, and then, uh, 
Oh, it smells so nice. Okay, would you, uh, uh, uh I can, all right. Okay, okay, I'm living for something. This persistent for something, so. Okay, this one is, see it, that lesson. Okay, now we're going to let it, when it comes to a boil, to a simmer, you add the shrimp, cook for two and a half minutes, no more. But after that, the shrimp becomes rubbery, and we don't want that. So, that takes care of that. Now, let's see how the gorditas are done. Thank you. Wait. The gorditas are corn. You know, corn was invented by a woman about 7,000 years ago, seven to 9,000 years ago. Did you know that? No. It was. In Mexico, uh, the signs of the of the corn being born are that it is not there and then suddenly it's there. And they see characteristics to a, to, to, a, to a grass. And we know it was a woman who engineered it because women were in charge of the food. Women were in charge of the gathering, the cooking techniques, and so forth. So uh, that's why we say a woman invented corn. And then here is how you do, when she then, after 2,000 years after that, it wasn't good enough. You know, we have to think of these things. Our, 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 our peoples are very, very uh, ancient to this land, even though the techniques are current and contemporary and still very delicious. So after 2,000 years, uh, they recognized that the corn was not sufficient. The protein was not good enough. They weren't getting enough nutrition, nor did it have niacin, and therefore niacin is important to stay alive. So again, another woman engineered the process called nixtamalization, which takes corn and, and, and changes the molecular structure of corn so that it becomes, instead of maize, it becomes nixtamal. And nixtamal is corn that has been molecularly changed through the process of nixtamalization, and the protein is much, much uh, uh, stronger, and it can be absorbed in the body fast uh, more quickly, and it has niacin which corn does not. You won't, if you eat a corn cob, you won't get niacin, enough niacin, no, at, at all. So uh, the process of nixtamalization then made it so that this masa could sustain a civilization for millennia. And let me just see. Mira. I'm gonna take some of this out because we don't have enough water. While I do this, I'm going to ask uh, Rosalia to add the shrimp. And you can see when you add the shrimp. Oh, you want you want vegetarian? What? You want no shrimp? Oh. We could have made some without. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. No, put it in. <laughs> I don't want to sound like a chef, okay? <laughs> so now you have, oh, that looks lovely. And then you, you then, then the shrimp turns white and it's just perfect, it's red. So I'm going to make this and then I'm gonna pass it around so you can see how it needs to feel. You, you're not, this is not gluten, you're rehydrating the dried corn. The dry corn was invented in San Antonio in, in the 19, uh, late 1800s or early 1900s by a man Ramirez uh, because you would make masa by grinding the corn, adding water, and you would use it immediately. But that's so time consuming. He said, if I can hydrate, uh, uh, dry the masa, it turns into powder, and then I can sell it, you can rehydrate it. So that was invented in San Antonio. So this is the masa. Um, now you have to add salt. Donde esta la sal? La sal? My salt. Uh, here is why you have to add salt. Most of my friends who are not Mexican cooks are saying that the, the tortilla is a wrap. I want to make a wrap. Or it's, a, it's, it's something for a filling. So, oh, the tortilla is tortilla with chicken or tortilla with nopales. I say, no, tortilla is the thing itself. You eat the tortilla off the comal just with salt. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can add a slice, a slice of avocado. 
But if you don't have a good tortilla, nothing works. The tortilla is the thing itself. So it has to be really good corn, tasty, and so that's why you add salt. I make the masa and I always taste it because it has to taste good. There's more salt. <laughs> it needs more salt. And so when you get it to taste really good, then you know that when you serve it, it's the gordita. Actually, when you eat it, taste the gordita. You'll see it is the flavor of the gordita. It's not just there to catch something that's more important. Corn is queen. Okay, let's try it again. Yes. Mm, okay. I think I got it now. I'm going to pass this around. If I can have three. Yeah. And whoever wants to, I, I'm wearing rubber gloves just so that you know that if you want to, you can taste it. This is what it should feel like. You can just take a pinch if you want. And <coughs> see how soft it is? It's a little bit wet. It won't be this way after it rehydrates. Uh, and then you cover this. You cover this and let it sit for about uh, 20 minutes or maybe 30 minutes because it has to rehydrate. The powder has to rehydrate and it'll smell lovely like fresh corn. Do not leave, uh, leave it out too long because it will sour. There is the gorditas. Now, what happens with the gorditas is you, you take, once they're rehydrated, little ball, and then you, and then you put it on a comat, a griddle, and then until it gets very, very uh, uh, a golden on the outside. In fact, let me show you. They're real golden on the outside, and what you do when you finish with them is you simply take a little spoonful of your lovely Oh, to rehydrate this, you can make these five, seven, eight days ahead, keep it in the refrigerator, and then like Rosalia is doing, you dip them in water and then heat them on a griddle very slowly so that the outside is very, very crispy and the inside is texture and very, very smooth and creamy. And then you take the lovely shrimp and cactus, you fill the little pocket like so. I'm going to make two of them. You, you, you make an incision so it's like a pita bread, if you, but it's, these are classic gorditas. They're normally this size, but we're making little finger foods. But this is a classic Mexican and Texas Mexican flavor. These are gorditas. Now, you want to add color and appeal. So we take queso fresco, crumbled it very, very fine, and holding it up, you sprinkle just, just a little bit for color. And then, since you have lovely red, white, then you finish by adding green on top. So you've got color on color on color. It's a very visual uh, art, the culinary arts, as you know. And so when you serve these at a party, you have a lovely, a lovely little canopy. So that's what we'll, that's what we'll eat here in a little bit. Okay, now. Uh, I will finish the uh, the present the, di the discussion of this food. Are there any questions up to now? I want to go into the flavor profile and how this changed in recent history in the 1800s, politically and economically. Oh, right. This is cilantro. Yeah, a, a very very finely minced cilantro. And Rosalio and I were talking, it has to be very, very finely minced because since these are small, you want the color to be, to be uh, you want the green not to overpower. It's all a matter of, you know as artists, you know, it's scale, pro yes, proportions and so forth. And uh, right now, uh, Rosalia is in The year 1528 is when the Europeans arrived. Can you all see the? All right. So they arrived. I told you before the native ingredients are matched by European ingredients. So now we're going to into the European ingredients which were imported. That's onion. We have onion in Texas, which is indigenous to Texas. But this is their 
brand of onion, and garlic, which is from Russia. And uh, we roast. Frying is not a Native American technique. Roasting is what we do. These are the gorditas. You will see how, on the left, the native ingredients of corn, sotol, beans, tomatoes, what we were used to. And we had to then contend with wheat, milk, onion, lard, which we already spoke about. I had a Facebook post that had a, uh, had beans in it, and uh, I said, it's vegan. And I was asked, how can it be vegan? Don't they use lard? I said, lard is not, is not a traditional ingredient for us. Sotol is, uh, I showed a picture of it, it's a bulb that grows in Texas, and you have to cook it for three days for the wow. carbohydrates to be digestible. Deer, turkey, buffalo, quail, met cows, pigs, sheep, and goats. It's been a lovely marriage. You know, everyone got along in the, in the kitchen and got cooked. <laughs> Indigenous, native, <laughs> with imported ingredients, give us changes today. That's what my second book is about. Tamalina is what this was originally called, called flour, and it was just very recently invented. The brief history, cuando estén listos a sacar, me dice si te I'm asking Rosalia when they're ready, I'm going to ask some of the staff people to start serving. And then we'll talk about it. This is, if you go, I'll, I'll give you the address where this is, but this is the original place where Tamalina was born in San Antonio. Here, here they are making masa longer make the tamalina. The first restaurateurs, modern restaurateurs of uh, San Antonio and this region are these ladies who would sell food outdoors in San Antonio and it's the real story of Texas Mexican food. It starts in the 1800s, the restaurants that we know today. And uh, these were outdoor stands, they served tamales, enchiladas. This is from 1885 in Military Plaza if you drive around you will see that it's by the farmer's market now. Here are some other stands. This is from 1908 or 1909. And uh, Military Plaza is not shown. Mrs. Victoria Senorio is, is cooking here. She's one of the restaurateurs of, of the period. So they are the original business women who began the tradition of uh, selling food in San Antonio in a more industrial way. Selling prepared food goes back to 1400s. Selling prepared food in marketplaces is just a very indigenous thing in Mexico. Most of the, most of the writers who write, other than myself and uh, some newspaper columnists of today, never mention the ladies' name. Not once did they ever compare them to each other as chefs comparing. They all, they all call them chili queens, which I don't like. This is some more of the same. They would sell tamales. The gorditas you're going to eat, of course. I'm going, I don't know if the, uh, if the camera can sh show the entire screen. I think uh, that when we look at these ladies and running their businesses, it's important to ask, were they artists? Were they business people? They were both. They married uh, both art and e economy so that they could sustain their family. This is how they kept their families together. The men helped, but it was the ladies who understood these things. And so here is, here is Luz Trevino, one of the original uh, women. Now, the locals didn't like it. Yes, that is para There's some ready. There's some. Some are going to get some, and the others are going to be looking. <laughs> OK, we'll see if they share. These are the ladies who have been encapsulated because the local government says you're not clean. Flies, we're afraid of the damage you could do to health. So they, they required that they put their stands inside the screen mesh. There they are inside. I think it's a wonderful picture of, of, of against adversity they continue. These are the original restaurateurs in 1900, a Chicago uh, visitor saw how good business it was to have a Mexican food restaurant, and so he started the original, Texas, the original Mexican restaurant in downtown San Antonio. He's the 
He's the original creator of Tex-Mex food, which is, it was, it was food for Anglos, by Anglos. And it somewhat resembled the food, but it wasn't. And the ladies then, this, these are the ladies working at Gephardt's chili powder. Gephardt was a German immigrant who, who took the chili powders that I use here, make them, I mean, make them into powders and commercialize them. Hugely successful, very inventive and creative man. But the ladies then had to work and show that they were clean. So this is a this is an advertising photograph that is used by Gifford's yeah to advertise that his chili powder and his products are in fact clean and the Mexican women are being supervised so that they can have their hands clean. This is the Palace of Sweets. If you can read that in San Antonio, they started to make Mexican candy. They wanted to be really, really uh, progressive and strong in their advertising. So this is what they did. Yeah. This is part of the history where we are doing the food and uh, it's being interpreted in their way. We'd rather eat the food, but we don't want to deal with the people. Our flavor profile is something that I think we don't. Let's let's stop there uh, before and take questions. Who's eating the Who's eating the gorditas? And okay, any comments? <laughs> They're coming out. Any questions up to now? I'm going to do one final mocha hit and then we'll eat. I, just that. Um Close by here, about half a mile, there's still the sanitary tortilla. You know, so just the title goes to what you're saying, and it's current, you know, 2018. Right. You can talk about that, and this continues till today. The point of, uh, of uh, writing Texas Mexican, uh, the art of Texas Mexican food, is to, is to show that people come together to make food happen. All food works this way. German food, Italian, what would the Italians do without tomatoes, which are Mexican? Uh, um, what would the Irish do without potatoes, which are Peruvian? All of food, like people, meld and come together. And it is, it is the, the question is, what is the art that will bring us together in a harmonious way? What is a new type of encounter that is not an encounter of conquest or violence, but rather an encounter of harmony and acceptance of the other. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, as a final uh, demo, take cumin, black pepper, and garlic. None of these are Native American ingredients. They're all foreign ingredients brought by the conquest. But the three have become the trinity of Texas Mexican cooking. I take this to classes when I teach, and anyone here who is, oh, this is the way a mocajete works. I hope the table doesn't break. If it does, bear with me. It'll be, it'll be good for the, for the viewers on video. So this is the way this works. This sound was a sound I always heard in my mother's kitchen. Now, if you take this and pass it around, those, those uh, of you who are from this region, I want you to tell me what this memory, because food is memory, what this memory is for you. Who is, I'll, I'll just, everyone can smell it. It's kind of heavy, but do it as fast as you can. If you're from this region, raise your hand and tell me what, what the memory is that this tactile, sensual experience is bringing up for you. This is, Comino, ajo, and black pepper is the flavor profile, iconic flavor profile of Texas Mexican food. We put it in almost everything. So anybody who grew up with this, they would have known that this is what mama and grandma used to, used to make. I'm not from the region, but in Ethiopia and Eritrea, we use the Isn't it interesting that food is always a memory? 
it links us to our past and to people whom we know. That's part of the power of food. Are there some other memories or connections that you're making? Um, in Honduras, in South Enteque, that I sing in um, another part here called Tiberoli. So when I hear that sound, it reminds me of, you know, food is about to be ready. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the moth starts salivating. <laughs> So it's an interesting sound. Yeah, Grandma. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I would like to, uh, to end with a reading from the book that uh, hopefully uh, will share the vision and the idea of the book, which is the food in Hawaii, in Ethiopia, and others, is all tending towards the same thing. Human beings cook, and we cook in certain ways. It, it, is, it is not survival of the fittest, but it's survival of the finest. That is where art comes in. And uh, if I can, I'm going to take a book because I didn't bring one with me, and read from the. I think it's from the final, and then we'll we'll stop. And then I'll give you a chance to read because we, they pushed lunch back as well. I uh, have it from the first chapter, which is the philosophy or vision of how this food exists. Conscious of the horrors of our violent history, I think that ours must be an aesthetic grounded in economic justice, the true context for peace. Most of us, the Mexican-American working class, are still economically poor, the vestiges of our previous devastations. We have limited access to formal education and health care. We dream of a society better than the one from which we have come. From this position, many of us wish to be artful chefs. It takes clarity of mind and palate to cook delicious Texas Mexican food. We develop this clarity by being true to the flavors developed by former cooks, as we laboriously learn from them and build upon them, and by being attentive to how we buy, prepare, and serve, so that we may foster awareness of justice in food, food production, purchasing and in wages paid to the workers. It is a work of love to share the recipes in this book. Hopefully we will continue to develop, to develop a loving finesse in our cooking techniques and appreciation of the humanity of all who come to our table. After all, our native culinary heritage prompts us to comfort, to heal, and to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Lunch is next.